All right, thanks, Tom. Um, I do want to acknowledge that in addition to the expert panel, we had a lot of input from uh, uh, some of the local engineering firms. Um, we ran a couple of ideas by uh, a few folks, and they weighed in. So um, their input was uh, greatly appreciated. I think Doug Bish is in the room here, and many thanks to you, Doug. Uh, but the first thing the panel decided was that we were not partial to any specific stream restoration technique. Uh, there are wars going on between different stream restoration camps, and uh, there the the Roska Knights over here, the Legacy Floodplain Knights over there, and they sit on opposite sides of the room. So one, um, one rule that we decided was that we were not going to be partial to any particular stream restoration uh, technique, and they're hybrids there also. We developed three protocols um, that address the different mechanisms uh, uh, that stream restoration has for reducing sediment and nutrients. There is a fourth uh, stream restoration category we considered called regenerative stream ch uh, uh, channel conveyance uh, for ephemeral channels, and I'll touch on that. That was not classified by the panel as a stream restoration technique, but more of an upland practice. The first protocol I'll get into in just a minute uh, it identifies a process for accounting for sediment reduction attributed to stream restoration. Uh, sedimentation from streams, uh, based on our literature review, um, is one of the largest sources of sediment uh, input into the bay. Um, so the first uh, protocol, which applies to almost every stream restoration project, accounts for that prevention of sediment from getting into the stream. Protocol two is an enhanced credit that enables um, a qualifying project to get additional benefit uh, associated with denitrification that researchers have found uh, that can occur for certain types of uh, stream restoration projects. Protocol three addresses uh, stream restoration projects where you reconnect the stream to a functioning floodplain wetland. And I just mentioned the, the fourth, the tweener dry channel uh, conveyance project is considered a retrofit. So just a few definitions. You heard uh, natural channel design approach. Uh, this is one of the most common approaches to stream restoration uh, developed by David Rosgen. Uh, he teaches a lot of courses here. It's a lot of people call this approach a template approach because it, it uses um, a, a reference condition and the stream uh, uh, dimension form uh, profile uh, of this reference reach to design uh, your restoration project. Legacy sediment, um, many of you might um, have read the articles about legacy sediment, sediment built up behind th the thousands and thousands of mill dams across the country. Uh, there are researchers from Franklin and Marshall University uh, that are saying that really uh, you need to remove those sediments to truly restore the floodplain, and it is uh, a restoration technique being pioneered by the folks from Pennsylvania. I would mentioned regenerative stormwater conveyance. Uh, you're going to be hearing a little bit more about that from Ted Brown tomorrow. This is an upland practice primarily used to uh, treat stormwater from storm drain outfalls that are discharged down uh, steep slopes. But there's also using similar uh, techniques uh, you can, uh, for restoring large stream channels and connecting those stream channels to uh, floodplains, especially in coastal plain areas. And I, I believe Ted's going to also talk about this, uh, referred to as wet channel design, wet channel base flow design. Other terms uh, that are important, 
prevented sediment, and as I mentioned, it is the prevention of stream bank erosion and incision that is the key benefit from stream restoration projects as far as getting credit for sediment reduction and nutrient reduction because those sediments are very rich in nutrients. Functional uplift, you'll, um, you'll be hearing a little about this. Uh, the stream functions uh, include hydrology, geomorphology, hydraulics, living resources, et cetera. Uh, permitting agencies uh, want to see a stream restoration project lead the project with the functions uplifted instead of downlifted. So I'll get into that a little bit. High free zone applies to our second protocol. Uh, the high free zone is that interface between surface water and groundwater. It's a very biologically active area. A lot of denitrification occurs there. Researchers have found that when you restore a project under certain conditions, if you can reconnect that stream to the floodplain, you can increase the denitrification rate because you're increasing uh, this, um, uh, the uh, volume of the stream that's uh, within this hyperreic zone. So I'll get into that in a little bit. Every, everyone knows what a floodplain is, but floodplain reconnection volume, as I mentioned, the second protocol accounts for when a stream restoration project can reconnect to a functioning floodplain wetland. Well, one thing you have to do is determine how much stormwater runoff is getting into that wetland so that you can get credit for it, and that's what the floodplain reconnection volume is. One of the first things uh, the panel did, and all the panels uh, did a comprehensive literature review. I, I think ours, uh, I think we read a, between 100 and 200 uh, different scientific papers. We looked at the basis of the, the original rate that the Chesapeake Bay program was using for streams and decided that you just can't use a constant rate to apply to all streams uh, in the Bay watershed. Um, we looked at how streams are simulated in the Chesapeake watershed model. Um, we're going to be working, uh, the Center for Watershed Protection is going to be working with, with Matt and the modelers uh, to uh, improve how uh, the model simulates sediments in, in, in the future in the phase six. Um, we also looked at uh, nutrients and, and the literature uh, as far as how streams uh, process nutrients nutrient dynamics in riparian uh, wetlands. Uh, we, we also looked at riparian cover. Uh, what is the interaction between stream restoration and riparian cover? Maybe we should be calling stream restoration, stream restoration slash riparian area restoration. Uh, we also looked at the longevity of projects. So the the first protocol, as I mentioned, we, we call the, this the prevented sediment approach because it, a stream, this applies to a str all stream restoration projects. This is where the largest source of sediment and nutrient reduction credit lies. And some of these credits are additive, uh, and I'll explain that in, in just a little bit. But the first protocol credit for prevented sediment during storm flow, because uh, storm flow is when most of the sediments um, are washed uh, off of streams uh, from stream bank erosion. The first part of this um, protocol, uh, you address, uh, you estimate the stream erosion rates, and I'll get into that in just a, a second. You convert those uh, erosion rates to nitrogen and phosphorus rates based on sediment chemistry. And then you estimate the efficiency of your project, which the panel assumed was 50%, and the panel felt that this was uh, a very conservative uh, efficiency for uh, stream bank uh, uh, treatments and, and stream restoration <coughs> projects. And uh, hopefully during the next iteration, 
uh, of this panel in 2017, we'll be able to bump that up a little bit. 